Welcome to Alabama Short Stories, when you're a little behind on your Alabama history. I'm your host, Sean Wright. I wasn't much of a reader in high school, and I read more than a few books I don't think I will ever pick up again. The one that stands out the most to me is The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. The novel, published in 1925, is set during the Jazz Age on Long Island, New York, and it tells the story of Nick Carraway and his interactions with the millionaire Jay Gatsby and his obsession with former lover Daisy Buchanan. It's been over 40 years since I made it through the book, but I still remember how difficult it was to get to the end. The general public must have felt the same way as it was a commercial failure when it came out. And when Fitzgerald died in 1940, he assumed the book was a failure. But a funny thing happened. World War II started. Now that's not the funny part. The Council on Books in Wartime distributed free books to American soldiers serving overseas, and The Great Gatsby was one of the books chosen. The book was regarded as an American classic by the war's end. It was added to high school curricula and was adapted to the stage and screen. Now, while writing this short story, I asked family and friends what they thought about The Great Gatsby, and they all enjoyed it. Maybe I should give it another read. The novel's plot was informed by a relationship Fitzgerald had as a youth. He attended Princeton, and as an 18-year-old, he met and fell in love with 16-year-old socialite Ginevra King. She was in love with Fitzgerald, but her father did not want them dating because of his lower-class status. Supposedly, King's father told Fitzgerald that, Poor boys shouldn't think of marrying rich girls. Rejected by a family for his lower class status, a despondent and suicidal Fitzgerald joined the United States Army to fight in World War I. While waiting for deployment in Europe, where he assumed he would die, Fitzgerald was stationed at Camp Sheridan in Montgomery, Alabama, where he met a 17-year-old socialite named Zelda Sayer. Zelda Sayer was born in Montgomery, Alabama on July 24, 1900. Zelda was the youngest of eight children, three dying in infancy. An older brother, Anthony Sayer Jr., died by suicide. He suffered from mental illness, which will appear in our story later. Her father, Anthony Sayer Sr., was an Alabama lawyer and politician who served in the Alabama House of Representatives and was president of the Alabama State Senate. Later in his career, he became an associate justice of the Supreme Court of Alabama. His wife, Minerva, better known as Minnie, was the daughter of a U.S. Senator from Kentucky. The family lived in the Silk Hat section of Montgomery, and while it was a well-to-do neighborhood, it was a step below more desirable areas such as the Garden District and Cloverdale. It was a stretch for the family to live where they did. They never did own any of the homes they lived in, and it was said that Anthony Sayre's interest in elected office was probably more of a need for money to keep up his lifestyle than any call to serve. All their homes were near the trolley line, so they would not need an automobile. But keeping up this lifestyle meant they had to have servants. There was a cook, a laundress, a yardman, and a nanny. Minnie was in charge of managing the home and servants and raising the children. Her husband's only interest was in how much money was being spent. Zelda was groomed for a social life, not to be social and have fun, but to find a husband. There was no money for college, and Zelda understood that her goal was to find a husband, preferably a well-to-do husband, because to not be married was to be an old maid. She did not attend private school like most of her neighbors did. Instead, she attended the public Sydney Lanier High School, the excuse given that her father served on the school board. Now, by all accounts, she enjoyed her time there, especially since there was a co-ed student body unlike the all-girl private schools her friends attended. She was more social than most of her friends, hanging out after school at the drugstore and drinking a dope, a Coke with an aspirin. Now, one of her friends was Tallulah Bankhead, who lived with an aunt in Montgomery while Tallulah's father was in Washington, D.C. Zelda was right in the middle of the Bankhead daughters. Tallulah was two years younger, and sister Eugenia was one year older. Summers in high school revolved around the many dances in the city. She was not allowed to go to dances at colleges such as the nearby Alabama Polytechnic Institute. Still, she had plenty of visitors, some driving from as far away as Georgia Tech in Atlanta. Montgomery was changing during this time. They considered themselves the Paris of the South, with the increase in industry and the Wright Brothers Flying School located where Maxwell Air Force Base is now. Citizens felt modern. 
so much so that even jazz music was becoming acceptable. Now, the Wright Flying School was the reason Camp Sheridan opened in Montgomery. 20,000 soldiers and airmen flooded into the town leading up to World War I, including a young man named Francis Scott Fitzgerald. The one thing that having an influx of soldiers in town did was erase any obvious class standing. They all looked alike, and they all dressed alike. There was a social order to some of the dances before, but now the doors had been thrown open. Zelda performed a solo dance to kick off one of those dances. Fitzgerald was there, and he asked around who this Montgomery Belle was. He was told she was too young for him, but he made his way to the dance floor and introduced himself. And a romance would soon blossom. All during this time, Fitzgerald was corresponding with Genova, hoping to renew their relationship. When Genova married a wealthy Chicago businessman, Fitzgerald professed his love for Zelda three days later. In November, the Army sent Fitzgerald to Camp Mills, Long Island, but the war ended while he was waiting to go to the Western Front. He was shipped back to Camp Sheridan to await being discharged from the Army. He and Zelda resumed their relationship and became unofficially engaged. Now, Zelda would not marry him until he could prove to be financially secure, and unable to convince Zelda he could support her, she broke off the engagement. Fitzgerald became so distraught that he threatened to jump to his death from the roof of the Yale Club in New York City, and he carried a revolver in case the mood caught him. He had been working in New York, and he quit his job and moved back to St. Paul, Minnesota, where he worked on the manuscript for what would become the book, This Side of Paradise. The book was accepted for publishing and became an overnight success, making F. Scott Fitzgerald a household name. Now, another bonus from the success of his book was that he could now charge higher rates for his short stories. Fitzgerald was a success, and the engagement was back on, but things were different this time. He told a friend, I wouldn't care if she died, but I couldn't stand to have anybody else marry her. They married on April 3, 1920, at St. Paul's Cathedral in New York City, even though they did not love each other as they did during their initial courtship in Montgomery. They set up home in the Biltmore Hotel, and their exploits became famous, from Scott doing handstands in the lobby to Zelda sliding down the banisters. Management asked them to leave, but they continued to behave poorly at the next hotel. Fitzgerald later explained their juvenile behavior as two small children in a great, bright, unexplored barn. Zelda and Scott epitomized the Jazz Age. It was a term that had been around before, but was popularized by Scott's short story collection, Tales of the Jazz Age. The Jazz Age had been interwoven with the phrase Roaring Twenties and was a sort of rebellion for young people against older generations. The Flapper, idolized by Zelda Fitzgerald, was a free-spirited woman. And during the 1920s, Women had the right to vote, to smoke in public, to talk freely about sex, and they loved to dance, especially the Charleston. These newly won freedoms in the excess of the 1920s were seen as a complete breakdown in the fabric of society, according to older people. The press followed the couple's every move, much like we follow celebrities today. The funny thing was that Zelda was not necessarily a flapper, she was a southern belle. Her Montgomery upbringing influenced her more than jazz. Scott quietly disproved of the extravagant parties and the rich people throwing them. Still, they were the poster children of their generation. During this period, both of the Fitzgeralds' alcohol consumption increased, leading to more and more quarrels. They would accuse each other of infidelity and believed their marriage would soon be over. Then in 1921, they had a baby. Scott was writing The Beautiful and the Damned, and the couple moved back to Scott's hometown of St. Paul, Minnesota to have the child. The couple's only child, Francis Scott Fitzgerald, better known as Scotty, was born on October 26, 1921. When Zelda was emerging from the anesthesia fog, her husband recorded her saying, Isn't she smart? She has the hiccups. I hope it's beautiful and a fool, a beautiful little fool. He used this quote almost verbatim for Daisy Buchanan's dialogue in The Great Gatsby. Scott finished The Beautiful and the Dam the following year, featuring a young artist and his wife who spent their time partying in New York City. He became bankrupt because they were waiting on an inheritance instead of creating a meaningful and productive life. The family moved to France in 1924 where Scott worked on The Great Gatsby. Drama followed them as Zelda became infatuated with Edouard Joson, a French aviator. 
He asked for a divorce from Scott and soon after overdosed on sleeping pills. Jozon, realizing what he had gotten into, disappeared, never to speak to the couple again. They relocated to Rome, where Scott continued working on Gatsby and finally submitted it for publication. But Fitzgerald moved back to France and became friends with Gertrude Stein, Ezra Pound, James Joyce, and Sylvia Beach, a group that would become part of the Lost Generation. Scott became friends with an unknown Ernest Hemingway. Hemingway would become one of Zelda's harshest critics. Zelda shot back with accusations that Scott and Hemingway were lovers. Zelda even threw herself down a staircase when she felt Scott ignored her during a party. Needless to say, the two had a dramatic relationship. Underneath all the drama and Scott's infidelities, Zelda was searching for a creative outlet and wanted to be a writer. She had already been a source of inspiration in Scott's books, and a passage from his book, The Beautiful and the Dam, was presumably lifted from Zelda's diary. Zelda rekindled her childhood passions in art and ballet. Even though she was a skilled dancer and worked hard at it, it was evident that she was too old to become a professional ballet dancer. As the 1920s ended, the Fitzgerald's life, no matter how dramatic, would change forever. In 1929, the stock market crashed. Already in debt, their extravagant lifestyle and the crash would leave them in financial ruin. Zelda would have her first mental breakdown the following year and be diagnosed with schizophrenia. She was committed to the Prangins Clinic in Switzerland, where she would stay for 15 months. Before the end of the stay, her father passed away in Montgomery in 1931. The couple moved back to Montgomery, purchasing a home on Felder Avenue, which today is the Scott and Zelda Fitzgerald Museum. Her father's death and the continuing breakdown of their relationship would send Zelda to the Phipps Clinic at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore in 1932. While there, she wrote her novel, Save Me the Waltz. More tragedy came into Zelda's life in 1933 as her brother Anthony, six years her senior and closest sibling by age, died by suicide. During all this, some believe that Scott helped drive Zelda into mental illness or at least contributed to it. That his alcoholism fueled cruel and abusive behavior towards Zelda. He would criticize her writing and dancing and label her painting as third rate. In 1934, Zelda wrote a play called Scandalabra, and Scott published Tender is the Night, whose main characters are based on the couple. Once more, Zelda is the inspiration for Scott's novels. In 1936, Zelda would be committed to the Highland Hospital in Asheville, North Carolina, where she would stay until 1940. She would never see her husband again. Scott moved to Hollywood to write screenplays and engaged in a long-term relationship with gossip columnist Sheila Graham. They moved in together, and Graham discovered Scott's body when he died of a heart attack in 1940. Zelda was released from the hospital in 1940 and moved back to Montgomery to be cared for by her mother. She would return to the hospital from time to time when her depression became too debilitating. She was there when a fire swept through the hospital's main wing on the night of March 10th to 11th, 1948, killing her and nine other women. It had been over a decade since she last saw her husband, but they would be together in the end. Zelda and Scott were buried together at the now-called St. Mary's Church Historic Cemetery in Rockville, Maryland. So what happened to their daughter, Scotty? During her childhood, Scotty moved around the world with her parents, from France to Italy and back to the United States. When she was 15, she attended a boarding school in Connecticut. Fitzgerald's agent, Harold Ober, and his wife, Anne, acted as surrogate parents, visiting her at school and giving her a place to stay during holidays. Her mother, Zelda, was in a hospital in Asheville during this time, while her father had moved to Hollywood. Scotty was expelled from the school for sneaking out to visit a romantic interest at Yale, she soon entered Vassar College, and before she graduated, her father died of a heart attack. Scotty became a writer and a reporter working for Time, The New Yorker, The Democratic Digest, The New York Times, and The Washington Post. She was married twice and had four children. After her second divorce, she moved to her mother's hometown in Montgomery. While researching her family history, Scotty discovered that her grandfather, Anthony Sayre, had helped usher in the Jim Crow era in Alabama by introducing the 1893 Sayre Act. Sayre said it was introduced to eliminate the Negro from politics and in a perfectly legal way. This shocked and embarrassed Scotty and drove her to dedicate her time to voter outreach programs in Alabama. She would be involved in state politics and encourage young women to become involved in politics and run for office in Alabama. 
She died in Montgomery on June 18, 1986, at 64. She's buried next to her parents in Maryland. In 1992, Frances Scott Fitzgerald was inducted into the Alabama Women's Hall of Fame in the same class as her mother, Zelda. At the end of her life, Scotty gave a final thought about her parents to a biographer. I have never been able to buy the notion that it was my father's drinking which led her to the sanitarium, nor do I think she led him to the drinking. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Alabama Short Stories Podcast. I'm happy to announce that Volume 2 of the Alabama Short Stories book is now available and features stories from Seasons 4 through 6. You can purchase it and Volume 1 online at Amazon.com and other online retailers. If you'd like to support your local bookstore, you can purchase it through bookshop.org, where your purchases will help financially support independent bookstores. You can find links in the show notes and on the website. See you next time at Alabama Short Stories.